So when we're talking about persuasion, I think you really have to picture the whole package. You can't just think about the words you're saying. You can't just think about the message. You have to realize that you're reaching an audience. You're trying to get them to respond in a certain way. And that takes a certain level of engagement with the audience. And it's all about how you phrase things, the order you say something in, the backdrop that you have, the feeling in the atmosphere when you're trying to convey a message. One of my ones that I really enjoy is Francis Chan. I think he does a great job at public speaking and at building an opinion on things. When you listen to him, you think, yes, like I want to make those life changes. I want to do this. And it's true. We have a theological agreement with him. We tend to believe that usually because we're in line with his thinking. But if you are in public relations, you start to look at people and say, why are they speaking that way? What is it about the way they presented that information that got everyone excited? So here's an example. It's kind of small, so picture it on like a computer screen. But it's an example of him and a time when I think a lot of people felt he was especially persuasive. So much instability, so much that we don't understand, like that we don't know. For me, growing up, it was, uh, a lot of you guys know my mom died giving birth to me, and my dad remarried, then my stepmom died in a car accident when I was nine. Then my dad got married again. Then my dad died of cancer when I was 12. And so I'm in junior high, my mom's dead, my stepmom's dead, my dad's dead. The only close relatives I had were my, my aunt and uncle, George and Sandra. And then when I was in high school, they got in a fight, and my uncle George shot and killed my aunt, and then stuck the gun to his own head, killed himself. So I'm 16 years old, and this is life to me, going, man, what's next? Everything seems to be falling apart, and we get a little worried, we get a little scared. And this is what Christians do, you know, they try to serve God, but then things get a little rocky, and things get a little unstable. And so we go, okay, that was nuts, I don't, I don't want to live like that, let me, uh, let me hold on. And this is your routine, this is what so many people do, they go, you know what, I'm not going to try anything crazy. I'm just going to sit here, and uh, I'm just going to hold on, and... Uh, <laughs> This is what you look like. You just go, uh, this is what people do. You know what, I'm just going to have my nice little family. We're just going to, um, you know, we're just going to keep to ourselves. We're going to live in a gated community. I'm going to homeschool my kids, make them wear helmets everywhere. I'm going to, um, you know, I'm not going to let them outside because sun has bad rays. I'm going to, um, you know, just on and on and on. And you just live your life in the safety of I don't want to do anything crazy for God. I just... I just want to, you know, go to church on Sundays and maybe give like 2% um, and uh, maybe serve health and nursery because I feel guilty. And then you do this your whole life and then you, you go, your greatest prayer is like, God, you know what? I would love to die in my sleep and not even feel it and then just go up to heaven. And so you want to die like this, just in your sleep, ooh, right in the middle of the dream, good dream, the dream you're going to heaven and you don't even feel it and then suddenly you wake up you stand before the judge and you go. <laughs> now, if uh, could you imagine? Could you imagine watching the Olympics? You know, and some girl does that. Just gets up there, starts straddling the thing, and then steps off and goes. What is the judge supposed to do on the card? You see, and to me, I go, man, that's the routine that so many Christians are headed for. That's the routine, the boring, I do nothing crazy because I don't want to fall. I, I, that, that's the routine that they're going to live, and then one day it's going to be a shock because they're going to step off that balance beam and realize they're standing before the judge. So I know, you could watch him all day. He has incredible messages. But did you notice, okay, we could talk theology because I love theology, I would love to do that. Yes, I, great points. From a PR perspective, what did he do in the beginning? He built rapport, right? He started off talking, he told you about his life. Did you understand him more? Did you think that he was more credible? Maybe a little bit because he understood life. He hadn't had a really comfortable <coughs> life. He built rapport with his audience.
And in the midst of that, he does something with his body. We are not creatures that are just spirits or just body, we're, we're mixing. So when you talk to people and you use your body or the things around you, you bring more into the conversation. So he is physically demonstrating what he's talking about. So you're hearing it from two different realms. He used humor. Humor is an incredible tool in helping people get on the same page. It can kind of break down barriers that you might have. It can tune in latent audiences because suddenly they're interested. It can build even more rapport with people who are already tracking with you. It's, it's incredible. And he used that as well. And then he finished and he summed it up. He explained what it meant. So he got you on board by saying, this is who I am. This is why I can talk about this. It's real. I've lived this. He had humor. He had illustration. And he brought it all back together. Public opinion are opinions that can be expressed basically in the public on controversial issues. And it's acceptable. So for him, in a church setting, it worked really well. Did you notice when everyone applauded, right? They were like, yes, that's a great point. Where do you think he was at that point? Like location-wise, just taking a stab. Probably like a church, yeah, a church or a Christian, Christian something, right? So the opinion he was expressing is a public opinion. It's what everyone's pretty much holding. If you were to talk about the gospel here on Biola's campus, you would be talking about a public opinion. Most people agree that, you know, Jesus came and he died for our sins and he rose again and we should serve him. That's a public opinion. Now, if you were to take that same message and go into the middle of Iraq, do you think you would be talking about the public opinion? Be a little different, right? So public opinion are opinions on controversial issues that, can, that one can express in public without isolating yourself. If you're expressing an opinion in a public setting and it isolates you, you know that you're not in the public majority. You're then in the public minority, right? And the goal of PR is usually to help get opinions taken to the public in such a way that everyone can be in that place and agree on it. You want your clients' opinions to be held highly. You want people to be able to advocate for those areas. And there are a number of ways to do this. And one of the ways that public relations uses is by identifying opinion leaders and getting opinion leaders to be the catalyst of change. There's two kinds. You have a formal opinion leader, and those are the leaders who are formally elected or put in a place of office. So they are the president, they are your AS representatives here on campus, they are people who are mayors or who have a position, they're maybe hired. But you have informal opinion leaders, and those are people who have clout mainly because of who they are. They're the popular kids, right? They say something and people agree. They're well liked, they're pillars in the community. So you see these two kinds of leaders. Now, interestingly enough, it used to be you'd always go to formal opinion leaders because they had such a following. But what you're seeing in culture today and what you're seeing with social media is that informal opinion leaders have a lot of influence. What people are saying when you can target the individuals, not the celebrities, not the people who are elected, the individuals, then you make a huge difference. So now public relations needs to focus on formal opinion leaders and informal opinion leaders. And it depends on what you're trying to do, what message you're sending, how it fits into your campaign. So for example, if I wanted to get a celebrity to endorse my product, that would be a formal opinion leader, really. I mean, they're, they're high status. It's not just because everyone likes Beyonce. It's because she's famous, right? Maybe they do like her, but oh, she's a name that's known. However, if my next door neighbor said something, I might be more apt to listen to them or someone who's really active in my church. I'd be like, oh, okay. So formal, informal. Any questions on the difference between a formal or an informal? Cool. Here's where it starts to get a little tricky. We're starting to deal with how you change public opinion. And um, PR pros have talked about a lot of different ways that happens. And there's a lot of different theories out there. And again, a theory is just an explanation for how something works. So the question at hand is, how do you take something that's not a public opinion and make a difference? How do you influence values, opinions, beliefs, and behaviors when that's not a widely held position? And you can look at opinion leaders, but then you look at different theories. So the two-step flow theory is basically, it goes from the opinion leader to the public. If you can get an opinion leader to advocate for your position, to say that your opinion is good, then the public will follow. That's a two-step flow theory. Now, just looking at that, what do you think might be a problem with that? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, if the opinion leader does something controversial or like against the morals of the public, then they're not going to respond as well. Yeah, your opinion leader might not work out very well. They might not be respected. It also simplifies communication a little bit too much, I think. People are complicated. The way we communicate, the way we form opinions and values, beliefs and behaviors is complicated. So simply to say it goes from opinion leader to being public doesn't quite encompass the whole picture of what's happening. And that's why we have other theories. So a multi-step flow model is basically that the opinion leader sifts through with their opinions a variety of mediums and then disseminates the information. So there's multiple steps. It might have an opinion leader that has their response come out in the paper. And then maybe they do a television ad, maybe they're going door to door, maybe they're seeing people, maybe he set up a booth at the local school. So there's lots of different places that people could have encountered that. And because of the multitude of different channels, then information is gathered and public opinion is swayed. So it's a little more complicated. It tries to account for other ways. But some people say it's, you know, it's not really so much about opinion leaders. They're huge. But what the most significant factor is that we should care about is the media. Maybe it's the media that is really the opinion-making machine. And again, these are all perspectives. We're going to talk about them. But before we can, we need to understand them. So the agenda setting theory is really easy, given its name. It's basically that the media sets the agenda. The media makes public opinion. The media determines what we're going to talk about. Second level agenda setting says not only does the media determine what we're going to talk about, but it determines how we're going to talk about it. It gives us the concepts and the tools and the opinions that flow into our conversations. So therefore, it not only sets the agenda, but it sets the attributes of it. It sets, is it positive? Is it negative? Do we like what we're talking about? Do we not like what we're talking about? Do we think it's a conspiracy? Do we think it's a natural flow of information? Second level, or just straight agenda setting? Some people say that it's not really the media solely, but it's, it's that people depend on the media. So this is the media dependency theory. And that states that people have no prior information. The media has huge impact then. So people who are uninformed, general public who aren't paying attention to issues, their only source of information is the media. And in that case, the media has a huge influence. The main argument against agenda setting or second level agenda setting, people say, you know, that doesn't really account for individuals. It doesn't account for the fact that I might hold a different opinion. So it doesn't matter if I heard on CNN that this was happening. I still have this opinion. So that's why theorists came up with that and said, OK, so some people do have information. But when you don't have any prior information about an issue, the media is going to form how you talk about it. And where do you get information if it's not coming from the media? In this day and age, it's coming out on your Twitter and on your Facebook and on your TV and on your radio. So generally, they are the first to inform you. They are the ones to let you know what you're going to talk about and what you're thinking about. So these three theories all hit on the idea that media is forming our public opinions. Make sense? All right. We'll get through all the theories, I promise. Framing theory kind of goes back to maybe it's not just media. Maybe it is organizations. PR uses framing a lot. And that is positioning something in a certain light. So we watched the bottled water campaign, the one that I love with the dirty water in New York. That was framing the issue. That was saying, here's the issue in a context you can understand. They didn't go into inter-country rights. They didn't go into exportation and importation. They didn't go into all of that process. They wanted to frame the issue in light of people and in light of lack of access to clean water. Framing theory is when you put it in a certain way so people understand it. Conflict theory says that public opinion is built through conflict through healthy conflict, but it creates people discussing an issue and kind of arguing for the different sides in such a way that at the end of that conflict, public opinion has been formed because everyone has shared their side and everyone sees the different areas and has come to an agreement. So that, again, we have framing, we have conflict, we had opinion leaders, we have media. Lots of people are saying this is how you get the public theory. We're going to stop there and think through these theories then. So as a PR person, all of these theories can inform your campaign. All of them explain some processes. Now, I would argue that none of those theories can encompass everything. 
Not one of those will give you the answer for every single situation you have, but they can give you some insight into it. They can let you know like, hey, this situation, there's already a conflict. Maybe we should foster the dialogue because we're really comfortable in our position on it. And I think that if everyone could hear it, they would have more of an understanding. So we're gonna use the conflict theory and the idea that it's gonna build consensus. Or maybe you're saying, we have an issue that people don't understand and no one's talking about it. Maybe we can tie it into the media somehow and get the news to carry it out. And if they carry on it, then people will start talking about it. And then we can engage in public dialogue more. But before we can even start that public dialogue, someone has to be dialoguing about it. Maybe it's that the issue's out there and you really just don't have any advocates on your side. You need to get into the community and find some of those informal opinion leaders. Or you need a formal opinion leader. Maybe you can get the president to pardon a turkey and he can come to Disneyland. That's a formal opinion leader, right? So all of these are talking about how do you get the public to think a certain way? And it all comes down to persuasion. Persuasion is what we're talking about. If you're trying to form a public opinion, you're trying to persuade people to think a certain way, to believe something, to agree with it. And you can really do a lot with persuasion, but your reading talks about, which you haven't gotten there yet, changes hostile opinions. Again, this goes back, remember, one of the key reasons for needing PR was something bad happened to your company. Anyone know of something bad that's happening to any company right now? There's two really big ones in the media this morning. McDonald's and Ford's are being raked over the coals. They're having really bad things happen to their brand. There's a lot of hostile opinions with it right now. So they will need to use persuasion to try to figure out how do we respond. It's not only crisis and damage repair, it's how do we get the people who are really angry at us right now to change their opinion. That's persuasion. Crystallizes latent opinions and positive attitudes. So you're reaching into those audiences. Maybe they don't know what to think. This is branding, right? When you're launching something new, you're crystallizing it. You're wanting to form it. You're wanting to get it solid. So persuasion can reach out into the audience and say, here's why you should care. Here's why you should believe in us. Here's why you should get behind what we're doing. And then conserves favorable opinions. Remember, that's the third reason. You want to continue building your brand. Persuasion is continuing to tell people why it's important. So often people will drop off. I have a lot of groups I agree with, a lot of groups that I'm a fan of, but I'm not still active with them just because there's so many things to be involved with. There's so much you can do in life. And if I don't hear from an organization, it's not that I don't care, it's just that I kind of move on, as sad as that is. So persuasion, continually reminding them, this is why it's important, this is why you should be involved, this is what we're doing, this is why you should care, right? So persuasion can do all of those things. Here's an example of a persuasion campaign that Biola did last year. There was the opportunity for funding to be cut at a federal level for a lot of Biola students, and it would have impacted the financial aid packages at a lot of students, it was a Cal Grant. So if you have the Cal Grant, your package could have been cut by the government because of the budget issue. Biola, along with a lot of other schools, loaded a bunch of students on a bus and went up, and they actually ended up speaking before the government on behalf of this, sharing why the Cal Grant is important, how it impacts them, how it helps them get an education. That's persuasion at a governmental level. And they're actually, in a sense, opinion leaders, right? They're students. They're representing people here at Biola who represent the Biola opinion. Now, from the PR side, brilliant. Let's give everyone Biola red sweatshirts so that when they're on news cameras, you see that Biola's active. Not only does that say we want Cal grants for our students, but it tells the public that Biola's tuned in, that Biola cares about financial aid for their students, that Biola cares so much, we'll even take the students up there to help make sure that we don't lose funding. So Biola did crystallizing of opinions, it did enforcing current opinions, and it tried to argue against hostile things that would be cutting the funding, right? And the funding wasn't cut. It stayed, which was fantastic. So there's a lot of tips you can use. We're going to talk about persuasion, but before you can even get there, I don't think everyone always knows how to go into persuasion. So one approach that you'll read about is the yes, yes approach. You want to give people something they can agree with first. If you're trying to get them to meet you in the middle ground or come all the way over to your side, you want to find common ground to begin with. That's why you start with a yes, yes. What can they agree to? Yes, we all think everyone needs clean water. You're already one step closer to thinking about the tap water project. 
last week, it could have been Sunday or Saturday, I can't remember, was World Water Day. So it started out a lot of, do you think people should have this? Are you surprised they don't? Yes, people are surprised, great. You're already in on the conversation, you're one step closer. Use a yes, yes approach. Different mediums are also more persuasive than others, depending on the argument and what you're trying to get across. So radio and TV, obviously more persuasive, why? Really? Take a stab at it, I won't laugh, I promise. Right, you're hearing, you're seeing, you're connected with that person in a more substantial way. But if you're having a very complex issue, if you need to put facts and figures and background, print is better because you have a longer space. People generally have the space of mind to sit there and read through it. If I'm in a car and listening to the radio, I might connect with you on your passion level, on your ideas, but I probably won't remember all the facts and figures. If you're giving me tax numbers or voting information, all of that, do it in print. You need to select an appropriate spokesperson and have the right kind of motivation. So for example, if you have the wrong spokesperson and they're advocating for your brand, you are not gonna help your brand. You're gonna harm it. There's so many examples when people have come out on behalf of a brand and then they're either doing drugs on the weekend or for example, um, <laughs> I love it when a name leaves me, Tiger Woods. Remember all of his fiasco? He had sponsors dropping him. Why would a sponsor drop him? Why would they care? Yeah. Because they don't want, want to be affiliated or somehow put in the same boat as his mistakes. Exactly. So if you have a spokesperson who you don't want to be affiliated with anymore, your public's already going to veer off from them. You want someone that the public likes. You want someone that represents your brand so that when they speak, when they say something is good, valuable, worthwhile, the public believes them. You also want to have the right motivation. And I think this is where a lot of people are uncomfortable with persuasion, is because they've seen it done wrong. So for example, cars, there's so many ways you can do public relations for cars. You can talk about the number of deaths that happen to infants in cars that aren't protected and the horrible things that happen to them and the medical bills and the agony their parents lived through. That's a great fear tactic. That's horrible. You should not be going out and telling people that. Instead, how about talking about the way it protects? How many families have had great experiences? It's, it's the flip side. But instead of playing on someone's fears, Instead of trying to get them to do something because they're so afraid of what could happen or because they're so disgusted by something, talk about the good qualities. Talk about the things that are of value. Talk about what you bring to the table, not what bad things could happen. And I think that touches on ethical persuasion, which in future PR classes you get to learn more about, especially when you deal with media relations. But ethical persuasion really involves asking yourself, is what I'm trying to get across good for the culture? Is it good for the individual? Is this actually authentic? Am I being truthful with the information I'm presenting or am I skewing it? Am I somehow manipulating them? Those questions help you know whether you're being ethical. Uh, let's see what this is. What's up, ah, here's a great example of what I think good persuasion from a credible spokesperson. Anyone know who it is? Exactly. <laughs> we have fans. What's up, y'all? Jada's birthday is on September 18th. And Will's birthday is September 25th. Right, so we celebrated together for a month. Mm -hmm.
We'd like to take the time out to say thank you right now, Jamie. Yes, thank you. And think about donating your birthday. Really good opinion leaders, good persuasion. It's old, by the way. I mean, you could still donate, but you can't be one of the three to go. I know. Um, that is good opinion. That is good persuasion. That is getting someone who's excited, who's passionate, who has a reason. And when people tell me that they're afraid to persuade, one, I always ask them why they're trying to persuade me, because usually they're telling me that persuasion is not good and I probably shouldn't be teaching it or shouldn't be using it, which is in and of itself persuasion. People naturally persuade. We are naturally inclined to engage in topics and try to reach a consensus. It just happens all the time. If you listen to the conversations you have with your friends, they're persuasive in some way or another. But what you, <laughs> so many of you are staring at this, which has nothing to do with what I'm saying, but that's okay. This is good. Um, what you need to understand is that persuasion is not bad. What you do with persuasion can be bad. But if you are working for a client or a cause or an organization that you believe in, you should be wanting to persuade people. You should want to shout that from the mountaintops and tell people how great it is. That is where it comes down to. I was talking to someone today who's getting ready to give a speech. And this speech is something that they're really afraid of, kind of. They're nervous. It's in front of a lot of people. And I was able to look them in the eye and say, you know what, if you're giving a speech, there should be a reason for it. There's a book called Give a Speech, Change the World, and the basic premise is, if you're gonna take time to talk and expect someone to listen to you, it should change the world. That's how I approach public relations. Every client I take on, I see their ability to change the world, to change culture, to change lives. Therefore, I am so excited to advocate on their behalf and help persuade other people because I honestly believe it's for the best. It's good, it's going to do something beneficial. That should be your motivation. If you're nervous about persuading people for your clients, you should probably ask yourself why you're representing that client, why you're working on their behalf. If you're not excited enough that you think other people should also be advocates for that, you might not be representing something you wanna be proud of. Let's talk about eight factors that deal with persuasion. Obviously, PR always starts with research, right? So audience analysis. You really have to know your audience when you're in persuasion. You have to know where they're coming from. If in the middle of election season, you walk into a Republican room and try to tell jokes about Republicans, mm -hmm. probably not gonna go over so well. If you walk into a Democrat room and tell jokes about Republicans, going to go over better, right? If you walk here to Biola's campus and we're gonna speak in chapel and hold jokes about the resurrection, probably not gonna go over so well. I have some friends who are atheists who would die of laughter, probably. So you really have to understand who are you talking to before you even get to your point, where are they coming from? If you wanna start off with the yes, yes that we talked about, you have to understand where they're at to begin with, and that's a lot of PR. Are you fascinated with people enough to understand who they are? Do you care and respect them enough to know their opinions and know their thoughts and know their perspectives? That's your audience resource research. Then you have source credibility. Your reading will go into this more, but you can't just pick anyone as your source. They need to be credible. They need to have sincerity, expertise, and charisma. Now, a lot of times, you're not gonna be able to find all three of those things in one person, which is brutal. So obviously, you don't really want to give up the expert thing, but you can you know, tweak it a little bit. So if you can't get the expert creator of a product, maybe you can get the expert user of a product, right? So maybe if something is built for little kids and you can't get the engineer to speak or it just wouldn't work, maybe you get a mom who uses it all the time. Still an expert, a little bit different though. Sincerity, I can't tell you the disaster that can happen if they don't seem sincere. BP Oil, when there was a spill, they had a spokesperson, and it's gone down in history, of an example of someone who didn't seem to care about the issue. It really hurt BP Oil's image and brand, and it was all over the media about how this person was not sincere. Charisma, okay, there's a lot of spokespeople, we'll just be honest, who, had, who don't really have charisma when they're speaking, and that's the ability to engage a room, to try to get people to come along, to have that enthusiasm and that interaction. That's your job. 
you are a PR person, you help them understand how to get charisma, you help them understand how to conduct themselves in front of media interviews, in front of stadiums full of people on a one-to-one -one basis, you help them build charisma. If there's anything out of those that I would want to work with, it would be charisma. I really wouldn't want to try to position an expert who, excuse me, doesn't know what they're talking about. Sincerity, if they don't really care anyway, I'm not sure I'd have a lot of patience. And I don't think I'd really want to position them as someone for the company because as a PR professional, my ethics are all about I either really care and I'm behind this or I don't. So it would kind of be an ethical conflict for me to put someone in front of them and say, this person cares, not really, but they kind of care, just doesn't work. So if I had to work with one, I'd work with charisma. A natural thing about humanity and with persuasion is you appeal to the self-interest. That's kind of a harsh way to say it, but you tell the person why it's valuable for them. Why should they change their perspective or their opinion or buy a product or attend an event or volunteer? Why is it valuable? Somehow it has to relate back to them. And so often we make sweeping claims. We say things are good for humanity, it's good for the world, it's, it's whatever, but we miss the one, we miss the person. And that's another tenant of PR, right? We're supposed to be people who see people. We're supposed to be someone who connects the public with our organization. So you need to be able to appeal to the individual. You need to make it relevant to them. You need to be able to answer why does it matter. Clarity of message. You want to help people make concise statements. Sometimes, especially when it's a public opinion, they want to go on and on. I have had some clients who are so deeply passionate about what they do. They talk about it for half an hour every time someone says, oh, what do you do? They don't want a half an hour statement right there. They want like a one sentence response, right? So you have to help people who are very passionate, who have dedicated their life to certain things, concise statements. That's hard. Get a concise statement. Practice with them. Timing and context. I had one client, and yes, he was very passionate. He was a person who could talk for half an hour. But the hard part was the timing and context didn't always work. So we would be passing people at a big convention, and he would stop as they were trying to get to a meeting to tell them his spiel, in a sense. Or it would be, oh, how's your family? My family's good. Let me tell you about my project. It just wasn't the right timing and context, and it started to feel really insincere and contrived. And the thing was, I knew my client. I knew he was one of the most sincere people ever. I knew it was very much from his heart, and it was a very, very good cause. But the timing and the context were so awkward, it was hurting relationships. So that's your job, again, as a PR person. How do you finesse that? How do you <laughs> help them not to do that? Audience participation, which you see me trying to do all the time. You stop, you ask questions, you get people to interact. It is so easy to tune out. It is so simple to be checking a phone, to be checking your computer, to be thinking about what you're doing next because we live in a fast-paced society. We're constantly multitasking. So if you truly want to know if your audience is buying in, get them to interact, get them to say yes, get them to turn to the person next to them, get them to do something. You always want to have suggested actions. If you get people on board with an idea and leave them with nothing to do, no outlet for that agreement, they're kind of going to fizzle out. It's going to have less effect. So have a sign-up sheet for more information or have them have something they can buy or have them have a pin that they can wear. Something that they can do as a tangible result of reaching agreement. And then just kind of basic structure if you've taken any speech class. The structure and content, the way you present information, how you have an opening, you have a middle, you have a close. It's kind of the tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them idea. You want to have a flow. You cannot just get up and talk. You cannot just say, I have an idea, let's share. You really have to have a structure. So those are eight factors of persuasion. Make sense? Uh -uh, audience engagement. Limits to persuasion. Lack of message penetration. So you could have a great message, but it didn't go anywhere. You didn't have it on the right outlets. You had the wrong speaker, so people weren't understanding it. You didn't put it in the newspaper and it was complicated, so the radio, they lost it. Some reason, your message didn't get to the people you were trying to. That's a lack of message penetration. But you could also just have a lot of competing messages. In this day and age, there are so many different people wanting something. So around, again, election time, so many addendums are out there and so many different propositions. It's hard to know if you've really heard them all because there's so many signs, competing messages. There's also this really interesting thing of like self-selection. 
So you will most likely go and listen to someone you already agree with, right? So most likely you're gonna listen to someone who you don't need to be persuaded by. Very often you say, wow, I completely disagree with this person, I'm picking that session. It just doesn't happen. If you're on a radio station and you're like, oh, I can't stand this newscaster, you'll switch the station. If you're reading an article and you find it really annoying, you most likely move on. That's self-selection. Now, okay, you might be someone who says, I really wanna open myself up to other ideas. That's great, you are the minority in that, and that's okay, but realize when you're dealing with trying to get a public opinion, a lot of people self-select. That's why you use opinion leaders. That's why they have to be listening to someone they already agree with, they already have some relationship with, because that's how you move the people into getting agreement on a topic or an idea. And self-perception is another issue. So, for example, I showed you guys the bag that flowed free and was the recycling thing, right? I thought, I, I did, I thought I was a good conservationist person. I thought I took care of the planet. I'm from Arizona. We didn't really have recycling. So when I came to California and I saw all these buckets and they're all different colors and there's apparently like rules, I can't just put stuff in all of them. I suddenly realized for the first time my self-perception that I was just really like on top of a person wasn't really accurate. I still have no idea how to recycle. I really, really want to learn. I just don't understand it. So my self-perception had to be changed, right? You're going to deal with audiences who have certain perceptions of themselves. And sometimes, even if their perception is inaccurate, they're not going to hear your message because they think they're a different way. I didn't really listen to a lot of here's how to recycle messages because I thought I was doing great. Apparently not, but I thought. So I didn't listen to the recycling messages. That's something you have to go against. So if you're trying to get activation for some sort of cause, maybe they already feel like they're really active for the cause. And to them, active for the cause means they care about it. But for you, active for the cause means you're gonna show up and do something. They have a perception, they're not hearing your message because they think they're already part of it. So these are four huge reasons why persuasion will not happen. People aren't hearing your message, there's too many competing messages, they've self-selected, or it's a self-perception. Any questions on those? All right. So here's some questions that we usually have. Is persuasion ethical? What do you guys think? Is persuasion ethical? Yes. Yeah. It's ethical. It can be done unethically, but it's ethical. And can a Christian ethically persuade others for non-faith-based reason? That's usually a hard part for Biola students, I think. I think they're really, it's easy to be like, yeah, let's end human sex trafficking. It's a really bad thing, right? Or let's make sure that certain things are accepted across the board. But what about if you're trying to do it for non-faith-based reason? Is it okay to persuade then? So for example, <laughs> some of you are, okay, good. Some of you are saying yes. I'm like, ah, can't tell if we're on the same page. So what if you work for a company that is a for-profit company and they have a clothing line and they have a new watch and they think this watch is cool and they really want you to do a persuasion campaign that this watch is the cutting edge thing that you should get for dads for Father's Day. It's a thing of style. It's a statement of we care about you, dad. It's a statement of their company. It's the latest brand whatever. It's not going to change the world, right? Could you still do a persuasion campaign trying to get people on board for their dad? Or is that just you trying to make money? So, because this works so well, turn to the people next to you and talk about this. <laughs> then we'll come back together.
All right. Sounds like you guys had some good ideas. We're going to come back together. Ethics. All PR activities, including persuasion, should be ethical. So yes, you can use persuasion. We're influencing values, opinions, beliefs, and behaviors. And so are a lot of other people. That's a natural flow to economics and business and culture. But it still needs to be ethical. So obviously, we have some things like such as do not lie, misrepresent, oversimplify, falsely lead, or link associations, pretend to have certainty, et cetera. It should benefit both the public and the organization. It really comes back to understanding the core purpose of public relations. We're creating mutually beneficial relationships. If you are trying to persuade people that a watch is a really good representation of your care for a father, and you know the watch creates cancer stains, stains, cancer, <laughs> on someone, or that you're representing a cell phone that's been known to self-destruct when people talk on it for 20 minutes. Those kind of things you know are detrimental. You know that you are falsely trying to persuade. But if it is a good product, and it's helpful, and it can take a message, why not? There's nothing wrong with that, as long as it's mutually beneficial. Make sense? I love the differences. Last year's Intro to PR class had a really rough time, so I came like ready today for big conversations about how we can persuade and all of that, and you guys are on board. So good. OK, so PR in action. As a group, find an example of persuasion, evaluate what you felt was strong and what could have been improved, and select one person to share your findings. Hopefully, we'll have time for the findings. I'm not sure. But when you look at this, consider what we talked about. Consider whether they used a media approach, whether they used the one step with the opinion to the public, or the multi-tiered, whether they used opinion leaders, whether those were formal or informal, whether they had a credible spec spokesperson, whether they had charisma. Consider all of those things we talked about, what was good, what could have been improved. You guys will have about 15 minutes for this. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.